This is a tale of a planet. It seems like a paradise for life, filled with vast oceans and fiery volcanic eruptions. Yes, we're talking about the blue planet. We are talking about Venus. Wait, what? In the early years of our solar system, Venus thrived as a vibrant world, a true haven for life. But at some point, everything spiraled out of control. This once heavenly body transformed into what we now recognize as the hellish landscape of Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system. The chilling truth is that the line between paradise and perdition is surprisingly thin, a fragile balance much more delicate than we would like to believe. Venus, our celestial neighbor, might seem like a vision of hell. Its surface is a blistering inferno with temperatures soaring high enough to melt lead. The planet is shrouded in a thick, toxic atmosphere, making it one of the most inhospitable places in our solar system. What transformed this once promising world into the inferno we see today? The answer lies in a phenomenon known as the runaway greenhouse effect. Venus may have harbored water bodies as recently as 700 million years ago, but it underwent a cataclysmic runaway greenhouse effect that turned its surface into a searing landscape, hotter than your kitchen oven. You might assume this extreme heat is due to Venus being 30% closer to the Sun than Earth. But that's a misconception. The average surface temperature on Venus is an astonishing 465 degrees Celsius. In contrast, Mercury, which is roughly 46.5% closer to the Sun than Venus, experiences much lower temperatures despite its proximity. On its hottest days, Mercury can reach temperatures of about 427 degrees Celsius. But at night, it plunges to around minus 173 degrees Celsius, twice as cold as the coldest recorded place on Earth. What causes Venus to be the hottest planet in our solar system? This extreme heat results from the planet's thick atmosphere, rich with carbon dioxide, also known as CO2, which traps heat in a runaway greenhouse effect. Thick, toxic clouds of sulfuric acid blanket the planet, creating a hostile environment. These clouds are so dense that they reflect most of the sunlight. And any sunlight that manages to penetrate the thick atmosphere is trapped inside. Venus lost its oceans primarily through a process of evaporation into its atmosphere. As the planet's surface temperatures rose significantly due to a runaway greenhouse effect, the water in its oceans began to evaporate. This water vapor then contributed to the thickening of the atmosphere, which was already rich in carbon dioxide. Over time, ultraviolet radiation from the sun broke down the water vapor molecules, leading to the loss of hydrogen into space. This process resulted in a significant reduction of water on the planet, transforming Venus from a potentially habitable world into the inhospitable environment we see today. The atmosphere on Venus is approximately 90 times heavier than that of Earth. If survival were possible in such an environment, it would look and feel vastly different from our planet. But here's the unsettling part. Venus and Earth began their journeys with roughly the same amount of carbon. What led our twin planet to go so terribly wrong? Venus and Earth share some striking similarities. They are almost identical in size and mass. Both planets formed in the same region of the solar system. So why did Venus become an inferno while Earth remained a haven for life? On Venus, carbon exists entirely as a gas in the atmosphere, making it thicker and denser. In contrast, most of that carbon on Earth is stored as solid carbon at rock, thanks to the oceans and life itself. Carbon dioxide released by volcanoes has been absorbed by the oceans over millions of years. Trillions of single-celled algae convert this carbon into tiny shells that accumulate in thick deposits of chalk or limestone on the ocean floor. Other marine life also uses carbon dioxide to build vast coral reefs. Interestingly, the ocean can even convert carbon dioxide into limestone without any assistance from living organisms. As a result, only trace amounts of carbon dioxide remain as gas in Earth's atmosphere. This is what sets our planet apart from its twin Venus. However, too little carbon dioxide could lead to a frozen planet, so it's beneficial that we have some CO2 in our atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere, while containing some CO2, is primarily composed of nitrogen and oxygen. These gases do not trap heat as effectively as CO2. Earth has a robust carbon cycle. Carbon dioxide is constantly being exchanged between the atmosphere, oceans, and land masses. 
This cycle helps regulate Earth's temperature, preventing a runaway greenhouse effect like the one that doomed Venus. But there's one major problem. Everything worked well until certain species began releasing increasing amounts of CO2 into our atmosphere. Earth's oceans play a critical role in regulating the planet's carbon cycle. The oceans can store large amounts of carbon that would otherwise contribute to global warming. This absorbed carbon dioxide is then used by marine organisms for photosynthesis, a process that not only sustains marine life but also supports the entire food web. The carbon stored within the tissues of these organisms can remain there for years, even decades, contributing to long-term carbon storage. When these organisms die, some of this carbon is buried underground, often becoming part of the ocean floor sediment. Over time, this buried carbon can form fossil fuels, which are stored deep within the Earth for millions of years. This process effectively removes carbon from the atmosphere for extended periods, however, this delicate balance is now under threat from a powerful force. Human activity, pollution, deforestation and the burning of fossil fuels represent everything nature once safeguarded us against. And now we are on the path to burning it all, quite literally. The Earth itself is alive, breathing in a cyclical rhythm each year. Many of our forests, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, play a crucial role in this process. In spring, these forests inhale carbon dioxide from the atmosphere flourishing and turning the earth lush and green while simultaneously reducing atmospheric CO2 levels. However, in the fall, as plants shed their leaves and decay, they release carbon dioxide back into the air. This cycle occurs all around the globe annually, showcasing how the earth is truly alive and breathing. This remarkable fact was brought to light in 1958 by Charles David Keeling, an oceanographer who developed an accurate method for measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide. His findings revealed a critical truth. The levels of carbon dioxide were rising at an unprecedented rate. This trend has continued ever since. Unlike anything seen in the past three million years, we can trace this rise through drilled ice cores from the depths of glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica. These ice cores trap ancient air, allowing us to glimpse into Earth's atmosphere over the past 800,000 years. For nearly a million years, carbon dioxide levels never exceeded 0.028% until the 20th century. But now they are climbing at an alarming pace. Today we have almost doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, over 0.042%, and this number continues to increase rapidly. The consequences of this warming are already being felt around the world, from rising sea levels to more extreme weather events. The fate of our planet hangs in the balance. We are releasing more carbon dioxide than the Earth can absorb, and as a result, the planet is heating up. This is an undeniable fact. For decades, we have been transforming our once pristine environment into something increasingly reminiscent of Venus. Yet many remain in denial. But how do we know that carbon emissions are truly responsible for warming our planet? Weather stations around the world have been keeping reliable temperature records since the 1880s. NASA has utilized this data to create comprehensive maps illustrating the Earth's warming trends since those records began. However, how can we be certain that our actions are the primary cause of this heat? What if the Sun is to blame? There is a possibility that Venus's hellish fate was influenced by the Sun. Throughout its life, the Sun has been gradually warming. In the early days of our solar system, it was cooler than it is today. As the sun's brightness increased by about 30% during this period, it likely caused significant warming on Venus, potentially leading to the evaporation of its water. Scientists predict that in a billion years, the sun will warm by an additional 10%. So could it be that this is not our fault after all? While the sun may be a factor in Venus's fate, it has little to do with the warming we are experiencing here on Earth. Yes, the sun will eventually get warmer, but this process takes billions of years. In comparison, centuries are like mere milliseconds to our planet. These short time frames do not significantly age or change it. In fact, measurements over the past decades show that solar output has remained relatively stable. Moreover, the fact that nights are warming faster than days and winters are becoming milder than summers further supports the notion that our actions, rather than solar changes, are driving this climate crisis. Furthermore, if increased solar activity were the primary cause of warming, we would expect to see warming in all layers of the atmosphere. 
This is because solar radiation would uniformly affect the entire atmospheric column. Instead, we observe warming in the lower atmosphere and cooling in the upper atmosphere, a pattern consistent with greenhouse gas-induced warming. This distinct pattern is a key indicator that the current warming trend is driven by human activities, not solar variations. The evidence is undeniably clear. Human activities are altering Earth's climate, and we have been warned for quite some time. In 1896, Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius calculated that doubling the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would lead to the melting of Arctic ice. In the 1930s, E.O. Hulbert, an American physicist at the Naval Research Laboratory, confirmed this finding, though it remained largely theoretical at the time. It wasn't until English engineer Guy Callender provided evidence showing the correlation between rising carbon dioxide levels and increasing global temperatures that the issue gained further recognition. Yet despite this knowledge, we continue to release the same greenhouse gases that have made Venus the hottest uninhabitable planet in our solar system. If we persist in this manner, Earth could become unlivable long before the sun's heat increases significantly. You might think that when things start to get really bad, we can just stop releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and everything will be fine, right? Surely we're not foolish enough to ignore the problem and assume that reversing our actions will fix everything, right? Wrong. As we stand at the precipice of a climate crisis, we must confront a terrifying possibility, the runaway greenhouse effect. This catastrophic scenario unfolds when greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere to such an extent that they trigger a self-sustaining and uncontrollable warming cycle. The result? An Earth that becomes increasingly uninhabitable, mirroring the hellish conditions of Venus. But how does this happen? Ice is the brightest natural surface on Earth, while the open ocean is the darkest. This contrast is similar to the difference between getting into a black car versus a white one on a hot summer day. A planet with more oceans means that Earth will trap more heat, even if we stop releasing carbon dioxide. As ice continues to melt, more land is lost to the sea. By the 1950s, places like Drew Point, Alaska, at the edge of the Arctic Ocean, were eroding at a rate of about 20 feet per year. Today, some regions are experiencing dramatic land loss, with reports indicating that certain areas are losing up to 50 feet of land annually. You might think that losing 50 feet of land per year is manageable, but much of the northern regions of Alaska, Siberia, and Canada are covered in permafrost, ground that has been frozen for millennia containing ancient leaves, roots, and plants. As this permafrost thaws, it releases carbon dioxide and methane, potent greenhouse gases, into our atmosphere. This means that even if we stop emissions now, we have already initiated a chain reaction that is making Earth increasingly resemble Venus with each passing day. The carbon dioxide that has been stored in the Earth for so long is now being released at an alarming rate. We have already doubled the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere compared to pre-20th century levels. Even without our continued emissions, these levels are projected to double again in the future due to the chain reaction we have set in motion. The future of our planet depends on our ability to transition away from fossil fuels and embrace renewable energy sources. Solar, wind, geothermal and other renewable energy technologies offer a path to a cleaner, more sustainable future. The fate of Earth is sealed. Sooner or later it will share the same destiny as its twin planet, becoming too hot to sustain any form of life. However, if we are wise enough to change our behavior, we can delay that day and avoid being the reason life burns up. This would give us billions of years to prepare for the time when the sun becomes too hot for life on Earth. If we can prevent Earth from becoming like Venus anytime soon, we might even devise a plan for the distant future when the sun reaches its burning death. For now, there's no need to worry about waking up one day on Venus. As Earth warms, our storms will continue to worsen, and this will be the first sign of the changes to come, signs that have already begun. Click on the next video to learn more about the future of storms and the fate of our planet.